We are being visited by the one, the only Aristotle, an FBB enthusiast slash coach slash persist member, ambassador of our of the FBB method, and a local coach just uh, across the bay. So welcome to um, HQ. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And here I, there, I was excited to see that this was a. Uh, got scheduled and this was gonna happen. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited. Super excited to be here. We are gonna do a full body pull day. So lots of posterior chain work and we're just kind of getting the legs going and get a little blood flow, but I was actually writing a piece of content. How do you know when you're warmed up? When I said you gotta have the peel a layer test going on. So it's like the second you start peeling a layer, you're getting warm enough. You gotta be kind of out of breath where you like don't wanna be having a conversation, which I'm getting close to, and uh, you gotta feel a little local muscle burn and pump. That's when you know the warm up is done. So yeah. anyway, I'm gonna pick up my pace for one minute so I can pass all three tests and then we can go get started. So Nate has been my training partner for the last several weeks. And because he was gonna be behind the camera today, he tested the workout for us already this morning. We'll, we'll start with some calf raises on this, okay. Smith. We'll do um, an elevated pigeon pulse. Okay. You know that one? Yep. And then we'll, we'll do a, just a, a pretty lightweight hip thrust on the machine. Okay. So three stations, three rounds. First track was minimalist. Um, this was back <clears throat> early in the pandemic uh, when things initially shut down. I was working at Fitness SF at the time, uh, which is a big box gym uh, out in San Francisco. And I'd just been so used up to that point with, you know, with strength training, bodybuilding, um, you know, lifting heavier loads. So having, a, having the gym shut down and then kind of figuring out where to go from there was a challenge. So um, minimalist kind of gave me an opportunity to take a step back and just kind of start to prioritize some body weight movements again, kind of regain, you know, body awareness and things like that. So um, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Currently following, uh, yeah, pump lift. Love pump lift. So it's a five time a week program, but now that market dropped the three day a week variation, I'm considering trying that out for a little bit, um, but I love it. So before FBB, I was kind of just following a um, bodybuilding strength, strength training based program um, that I just sort of threw together based on, you know, my own individual research, um, you know, having been in the industry, just kind of you know, taking what I could in terms of what I could apply to myself. And um, I didn't really necessarily have as much structure as I do with FBB. So, you know, having that extra piece of accountability and, and guidance has been really huge to just keep me consistent. Whew, okay. Let's see, we're ready to move into uh, our first strength superset. All right. And we're gonna do weighted hip extensions on the 45 degree hyper. Okay. And then we're gonna do a lying face pull, which has been a variation that I've been exploring in the last couple months. Mm -hmm. I really like it as compared to some of the standing and seated variations, just cause you get a lot of a lot of stability in the from the bench yeah and I find like it's very easy to isolate the traps rear delts shoulders so well that that sounds like the reason i've been liking the uh the chest supported the yeah. single leg or sorry single arm lap pull downs yeah yeah those have felt great so this is going to end up looking kind of like this and just make sure your grip is all the way through with these on the back of your hands. Okay. And try and pull the back of the hands 
as far back to your ears as you can. Uh -huh. And then it's pause for one second at the top. Okay. And I believe, I'll check, but I think we're doing sets of 12 on that. Okay. And maybe 15 over here. You can start. You want to start there? Yeah, we'll just swap. Okay. Get a warm up set. This is like our warm up set of each. Like I, I just, for, for my low back, really what I just think about is getting a lot of flexion in the hip on the bottom. Yeah. It's just gonna make me have to work. What I, I don't do is I'm, I'm, I'm never really going up into like- an, Like hyper extending. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, this I think probably, if I'm gonna bias like more of like a hamstring glute focus here and low back is just getting some added work at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, as it's showing up in our training split right now, we're doing a stiff-legged deadlift earlier in the week. Yeah. And so that's more our like major low back strengthener. Right. So this is just for like- Accessory. Accessory and like a, just a different, you know, a different loading mechanism angle. Like this is going to be the year my 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 back really builds grows huge i think i'm doing pulling exercises correctly after 25 years <laughs> training <laughs> finally the one thing i'm doing i've been doing consistently different is that generally in pulling and a lot this is true from a lot of pulling exercises the resistance profile essentially how hard is the exercise at different places in the range of motion. For pulling exercises, it, it often is hardest at the end range. So out here it's easier, in here it's harder. If you pull and you're very, if you're a stickler for range of motion, but you're focused on this end range or this finishing position where the muscles are in the shortened uh, position, you'll find that you'll start to fail for this last one or two inches way before you start to fail in the first half of the range of motion. But this first half, when your body is stretched, your back muscles are stretched and you're pulling, there's a lot of strength and hypertrophy stimulus that's happening there. Arguably, with some of the latest research, more strength and hypertrophy stimulus happening in this lengthened position. So if you were to stop your set, because you're doing set of, sets of 10, the second you can't touch your chest anymore, or you can't get your arms all the way back, okay, that's my fail point. Then you've left so much room on the table in that first half range of motion. So you see on these sets of face pulls that I'm doing, maybe the last five reps, I'm like not, I'm not getting all the way back, as far back as I was on the first 10 reps, but there's, su there's still such a big stimulus that's happening there. So, you know. Lengthened partials is what they're calling it. What's what the cool kids are calling it? It's just called working a little harder <laughs> and uh, and not not quitting 
Dude, you don't want to finish too soon on this, right? That's what she said. <laughs> you gonna leave that in there? Yep. Yes, yes. <laughs> Gotta leave that in there. Marcus, I've heard some people, when it comes to this specific movement, I've seen some people intentionally try to flex uh -huh. and really tuck their rib cage to avoid potentially hyperextending. Yeah. Or maybe getting past neutral. Uh, what's, your, what's your thought on that? Because I, I noticed you kind of stay neutral throughout, maybe even a little extended. I mean, I think at the end of the day, whatever helps you get the mind muscle connection or get like the right body parts working yeah. could be a good cue, you know, yeah. like maybe that's the right cue for somebody who's struggling to like know how to keep their low back out of it. Right. Maybe they're defaults. So I mean, I gave, I gave that, that cue kind of to Nate last week because we'd been done, done these for like two, three weeks and it was almost like his low back was not functional for the rest of the session because <laughs> he was yeah. biasing too much extension in his yep. low back. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if you can, if you understand, if like, let's say you have more muscle awareness or more body awareness and you can hold neutral position, you can flex your glutes, flex your hamstrings, not work your low back, not change back angle. Right. Then maybe it's, you know, it's not, it's not the cue that you need, but yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I'm all for people exploring different positions and then like, okay, great. Do that for four to six weeks and now try it where you do a different back position or right. maybe intentionally get some, you know, spinal extension. Like, yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause we do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to go do prone hamstring curls and yeah. we're going to do cable pullovers. Range of motion is just so, it's always so on point. You're one of my inspirations for that, man. <laughs> yeah, you. no no more half reps, choppy choppy movement, none of that. It's a lot well, of- that's, that's like another thing I really changed my beliefs on this last couple of years is like, I used to think it was like, okay, I can either train really full range and uh, maintain mobility, but I have to give up something in the way of like muscle tension and hypertrophy and strength. And I'm like, no, you know what? It's like mechanical tension is mechanical tension. And if you just find it at these really great ranges, full ranges through your joints, you can get just as much of the stimulus with lighter weights. And it's like better joint health, better longevity, and still sexy looking muscles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's important that we acknowledge that we're using machines for a number of our exercises today, but all of these has non-machine alternatives that work very well. So we're gonna go do some prone hamstring curls. You could set up a Nordic uh, hamstring curl, which you don't even need a Nordic bench for. You could just put your feet underneath something heavy like a barbell. We have uh, banded hamstring curl options that we put into our programs. This, we're using a cable for a pullover, but you could easily do a dumbbell uh, pullover, which we can demonstrate too. But we're gonna do a superset here. This will be our strength balance and uh, focusing on getting really great range of motion, particularly on this one, you know, lots of shoulder flexion and then try to keep your elbows pretty much locked in place so that this doesn't become a tricep exercise as much as it is like a back and somewhat of a chest exercise. But. Let's go even slower on the way down and pause at the bottom. Slow, slow, slow. Good, slower, slower. Uh. Nice. On your last rep, try and think about like, just lower it just as slow as if you were gonna do your next rep. Like you got a little bit fast in your last eccentric, try and go slower on that last one. Cause at that point, like you've done all the work and now just finish those last four seconds of that eccentric. about the 
last one. He did. <laughs> Do another one. Go. <laughs> right now. Best hamstring curl rep of my life right here. Go. Slow. Slow. Stop. Stop it. Don't let it move. Slow. 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 Hold tension. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And pause. And then stop. <sighs> there you go. Oh, it's glad we're here. Well, this, for the same reason that you would go slower on the eccentric on every rep, like the lowering phase of a lift, you are always able to control with a greater, like with, with slower speeds, because you're working with gravity rather than against gravity. So when you do a set of 10 reps and nine of those reps, you do this really slow controlled lowering. And then on your last rep, you, oh, you finish that last concentric. That's very tough. And then at the end of the last tough rep, you just unrack, unload really quickly. You're <clears throat> missing an opportunity. It's like, I don't care how hard the last rep is. If you finish the last rep, you can lower it slowly for the final eccentric or you know eccentric contraction. But it's more of like, it's a little bit of a mental thing. It's kind of like finish the set, do it here. But it's also, in my opinion, a great way to like pattern good mechanics. Like Aristotle just didn't do it. He's gonna have to pick it up again and finish. Cause he just finished his last rep. He worked really hard. His technique was super solid. And then he went whoo, and he arched and he just threw the weight down. Yeah. And so it's just missing. Not good enough. It's missing. There's like a sort of like on principle, but also it's work that could be done. And it's like, you know, if you do a hundred sets over the course of a, of a year, uh, then, and you miss the last rep on all of them, you did 90% of the work and it's like, you could be getting 10% better. Why don't you get 10% better? And then he holds tension at the very end range and now on racks. There you go. That's how you finish a rep or finish a set. Sorry to be a stickler, but you know, <laughs> hey, that's what, that's what got me here in the first place. So swinging the arms back. So rear delt is pretty much every, the, the only thing that's like really contracting here. Yep. You'll feel your triceps working a little bit, but really try and focus on pulling back through the shoulder rather than like any elbow extension. Okay. And then when you start to fail here, go right into an elbowing row Ooh. so that it's like a mechanical drop set. And you can even swing them close, like back towards me, further back. Yeah, pinky to the sky. Just focusing on just the biggest stretch you can get. Feel like deep in your oblique and, and also a little bit in your QL back here. Find that mind muscle connection in your obliques, just really feel like a deep stretch at the bottom and then my, my delts are definitely screaming i mean you can't see it <laughs> yeah kind of i mean compared to a little bit yeah, I'm slowly building my calories back up from the summer. How's that feeling? Getting bad. <laughs> bad how? Uh, I don't know. I think I'm attached or I prefer being lean. Being am I leanest? Yeah. Yeah. It has a very limited shelf life yeah they start to just feel feel grummy and i would say that i'm i feel better health-wise body performance if i were to eat even more than i'm eating right now yeah then i like have a psychological you know attachment to a certain aesthetic and that messes with my head a little bit when you it's 
it's pretty common amongst people that have spent any time in the bodybuilding world. It's like afraid to bulk because they're like, oh, I don't want to lose my definition. Right. It's really hard to like perform at your best and make consistent performance gains at sub 10% body fat. Yeah. This doesn't happen for many people. And even when I was competing in CrossFit, like I was lean, but I was never below 10% for any extended period of time. Yeah. And if it was, it was always unintentional. It was just like, I would get leaner closer to competition because my anxiety would raise. Yeah. I'd be training more and my appetite would be suppressed from my ang my anxiety. And so like going into regionals, I would be, you know, at the leanest that I was all year. Yeah. But it's not because I was like prepping or trying to do that. Right. Because I kind of worked out that way. On cortisol and yeah. Yeah. But yep. like for the vast majority of the year, I was like, you know, in the 10 to 12% body fat range, which was really good for performance and recovery. And yeah. You know, whereas in the past several years, I've kind of like sustained sub 10% for lots of, lots of most all of the year. You look leader than 10%, to be honest with you. What's that? Most of the time that I'm seeing you, you yeah, look now. leaner than 10%. Yeah, now yeah, you're. Currently, yeah. You got to be what, like six, seven right now? I mean, it's really. It's like so arbitrary, really, because like I'm not doing any, I'm doing like, you know, uh, in body scans, which they'll say on three or five or, you know, something like that. Like yeah. the number is, but there's certainly a threshold that I reside below yeah. most of the time, which is not conducive to like coming in here, training hard, recovering my best. Like I can train hard, recover, but I can't do it optimally. And, you know, there are certain times of the year where like I, I extend that, I try and get even leaner and I don't feel, after several months of it, I just, I can tell my body's like craving something different. I can personally relate to the uh, psychological attachment to being lean, Uh huh. especially being a kid and being overweight, you know, when I was up until I was about 13, 14 years old. Uh huh. And now that I've managed to kind of find where I like to sort of live at in terms of you know, leanness, performance, um, and just kind of how I'm feeling day to day. Yeah. I think I also kind of have a little bit of that attachment to it. Sure. I spent 10 years in front of a camera, seven years really in front of a camera, and I don't know anymore like how much that impacts my own personal desire to like hold a certain type of body composition. I know back when I was like younger and there wasn't social media and I was never on camera and I rarely took my shirt off. And the only people that ever saw me were like people that would occasionally see me in a cutoff shirt at the gym. Yeah. Like I still was trying to be lean and I was still like into it. It was yeah. like, that was probably the biggest test of like, I did this for myself, Yeah. but I didn't do it in the smartest way. And I certainly couldn't sustain it year round. Yeah. So it's like now how, how much of that is being impacted by the fact that, you know, we have this functional bodybuilding brand and that you know we're filming media constantly and i mean i don't know in the public eye I don't, i'm not sure yeah so yeah it's it's uh it's it's not something that and i, I know some like influencers or like people who are in the you know online they, they they're not necessarily fitness influencers but like you know their physical appearance plays into the business that they run right and I've had like, you know, off camera, behind the scenes conversations where it's like, yeah, it's, it can be draining and like, it can feel like, I know maybe my hormones might be suppressed because of how lean I'm trying to be or right. because I'm fighting this like battle of trying to be in a deficit for longer periods of time than yeah. I should be. Um, and there's no real end goal to it either. No. It's like you get lean enough and then you're kind of like, oh, I want to get a little bit leaner. Like yeah. how much more shredded can I get? Right. And then, no, I mean, you're not really getting, then you start to get some of those detriments, right? Totally. So totally. all right, pardon me while I take a quick break. I'm going to pop a link down below for my favorite electrolyte supplement, which is element drink element.com. I've been taking this for the last three years. And I have to say, this has been a huge upgrade to my health in my thirties. I never really prioritized electrolytes in the past. And when I started to, I started to see improvements in not only my performance, 
but my cognition. I make sure to take one packet a day, and it doesn't hurt that they taste amazing, they've got no sugar, and a scientifically backed blend of sodium, potassium, and magnesium. So go ahead and get yours down in the link below. My favorite flavor is citrus salt. At least speaking for myself, you come from some sort of bodybuilding background. Uh-huh. Once you get into that world, I feel like to some extent you kind of get body dysmorphia almost, right? You kind of start lifting, you see some results, and bodybuilding is so aesthetically driven, and there's so much aesthetic focus that you kind of play into that, and maybe you come to a point where you identify with it to a certain degree. Oh yeah. And that could be hard to kind of break, I think too, so. Yeah, I mean, it, body, body dysmorphia and uh, disordered eating is rampant in the fitness world amongst fit, fit people. Yeah. Probably really, really heavily prevalent in the, the most fit looking individuals about, out there. Sure. And um, I don't know, I've been very aware of it since I was in my like 20s. And you know, what was interesting is like my time in CrossFit as an athlete, I never like completely let go of it. Like I was always conscious of my body and, um, but by the time I finished my career and competing in CrossFit, I was so, everything was like almost 100% focused on just optimizing performance and recovery. Yeah. I just ate whatever I needed to, to be the best athlete I could be. Yeah. And it was interesting because like most of my 20s or a good chunk of my 20s was spent in this like bodybuilding mindset. And by the uh, time I was finishing my 20s and like my early 30s, I had this like like three or four year period where I sort of just like had escaped this like aesthetics focused, you know, drive through fitness. Yeah. It was very freeing. Um, and then it's like, it's kind of crept back in over the years as I've gotten further and further away from like performing for, you know, points in the sport across it. Right. Um, it's like, how do I ride this, like have this balance? Right. You know, because towards the end of CrossFit, not that I was eating on, like, I wasn't eating nutritious foods, but I was just like, it's just about maximizing caloric intake around lots of volume training. Yeah. Which didn't really support my goals beyond CrossFit. Like I wasn't, I, that didn't, that, that didn't, wasn't supportive of like health and longevity of like, I'm just going to train all the time and I'm just going to eat as many, you know, <laughs> carbs and <laughs> grams of fat as I possibly can between right. workouts. Like yeah. I'm not training double days anymore. I'm not training 30 hours a week. I'm training much less. Let's be focused on, yeah. you know, a better, better energy balance, be more mindful of that, right. getting a better variety of food. You're training for life. Yeah. But then, then, then like aesthetics became another tool to measure progress because now I'm not progressing in my lifts anymore. Like, <laughs> you know, beyond 2017, yeah. I'm not PRing stuff. Right. Uh, almost 100% of my PRs happened before 2017. I had like maybe two of them in 2018. And then it's been a steady decline since then. <laughs> like, you know, 360 pound cleans are not in my future. Yeah. They're in my past. And most of my PRs are in my review. So yeah. Yeah, that's not something I'm measuring performance or I'm sorry, I'm not measuring my success by. Yeah. You know, okay, well, I can measure my body composition or I can measure like some other thing it's like yeah. getting attached to something else that just gives you a sense of progress but and that was sort of the whole purpose behind functional bodybuilding for you right initially was trying to combine both of those worlds right totally bodybuilding yeah and kind of the performance you're getting with crossfit so. right yeah right which we continue to do and yeah. i think the vast majority of the time it's like for me it's still like this beautiful marriage but just like with anything like in you know there are periods of time in my performance-based training life where i pushed so hard that it became detrimental yeah i was injured yeah i pushed myself to levels of stress and intensity and in training that it just had a diminishing return on my life and that's when i yeah. shifted gears yep. same thing with like when i make a shift to like focus on more body composition for a period of time it's like yeah it's great for a period of time until it's not until you get bored or not even just bored like until you push it too far and you should yeah. feel detrimental health effects yeah you know and then it's like you know my detrimental health effects are like maybe my sleep gets a little bit disrupted or maybe my performance in the gym starts to drop or maybe i this start to be 
more hyper food focused and I'm just like thinking about it more than I want to be. Like I don't have any downtime from that. Like that's when I, that's that portion where I'm like, yeah, this isn't feeling good. That was from like October to November this year where I was like, this is not good. And I'm like, mm-hmm. gotta, I got to turn this thing shifting around. Yeah. And the shifting of anything is difficult. Yeah. I, when I shifted away from, from CrossFit into functional bodybuilding, like I had my, some of my identity was caught up in being this high level performer. Right. And then now I wasn't. Yeah. It's like, you know, I got lean and tan this summer. Right. So you know, this could be for anybody. It's like, and then. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, this is not optimal for me anymore. I got to shift gears. But, oh, man, I kind of, I like seeing what I see, you know? Yeah. There are plenty of other examples, you know? Like, you you put your put forth a lot of energy and effort towards something, uh, an athletic pursuit, a physical pursuit, a health pursuit. You get your identity caught up in it a little bit, and then you realize it's time to shift. Yeah. There's some, like, it's like for the people who are like, I'm a vegan. Yeah. And for three years, they're just like the healthiest that they've ever felt in their life. And then at the end of the third year, they're like, oh, man, I'm just like not feeling great anymore. Like, yeah, they start to see what happens for many vegans, which is like after a period of time, diminishing returns, diminishing returns. Like now I'm not getting enough, you know, a balance of amino acids. I'm not getting yeah. animal protein like I'm underfed in these ways. I'm undernourished in these ways. And then they reintroduce some meat and they're like, oh, my God, this identity I had as a vegan is like gone. Like what's yeah. going to happen? Like what are people going to think of me? What are, I, I, I miss that or like, you know, it, right. It doesn't, it's not just body composition. It's not just performance. It's food choices. Yeah. It's the, it's the carnivore, the staunch carnivore that was just eating meat. Who's now like, I got to eat fruit now. Yeah. I got to introduce fruit because that's better for me. And, you know, I have a whole book that's out that's called the carnivore, you know, code or, you know, what it's like, that was my identity. I was just. I think what you managed to find in terms of balance with functional bodybuilding, like, like we're talking about between these two pretty different worlds if you think about it right like high level performance and then something that's just very aesthetically focused Mm -hmm. with bodybuilding i think that's what attracted me initially yeah uh, with functional functional bodybuilding is because i was in this bodybuilding space i did start to become self-aware of you know probably a certain level of body dysmorphia just an attachment to how i looked all the time yeah right and i could see how from like a mental and psychological standpoint that wasn't necessarily sustainable or healthy for me Um, And I think that, again, what I found with functional bodybuilding, being able to, you know, coming from an athletic background now, you know, have more performance based goals. And then also more importantly, just kind of move in the ways that I want to move. Right. Yeah. Day to day life. I mean, range of motion wise, mobility wise. I mean, all those things have taken I've I've seen huge benefit from functional bodybuilding more than anything. And um, I've, I've never felt better, to be completely honest. So finding that balance has been huge. I love having just like the diversity of training. You know? Yeah, it's like now it's like, oh, I didn't do a lot of conditioning work back in 2023 because I was focused on something else. And now I'm like, OK, I'm, it's time to start ramping up my conditioning work. But yes, it's part of this system and this philosophy. And it's like depending on which training track you choose, you can kind of bias a little bit more. And speaking of conditioning, we got to we got a condition. Let's do it. <laughs> Well done for the day what was your favorite part favorite part of today's workout you know to be honest with you i like the conditioning piece yeah yeah i had a blast with that one <laughs> thank you for joining us today thank I you so much for having me here i appreciate everything you've done for us but, in the last several years spreading the word of functional bodybuilding and we out we out <laughs>